morning, everybody. And uh, for Dr. Joe, good evening. And he would good like to welcome all you. of you. Yes. We'd like to welcome all of you to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. And we are so privileged to have uh, one of the founders of regenerative medicine in the United States and in the world, in the person of Dr. Joseph Burita. We know him very well. Uh, he has trained so many doctors all over the world, including myself. And I know that uh, with his uh, expertise and trend setting um, uh, information and ideas, he actually had changed the world in a way that we see it from a perspective of uh, regenerative and restorative medicine, if you, if you would call it that way. So we would like to welcome all of you and uh, Today, we would be listening to a very important topic that I'm sure will benefit all of us. And this is about anti-aging. So uh, before we begin, let's just uh, pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and goodness and for your sustaining uh, strength for all of us. You have spared us, O oh God, from virus. You have lengthened our days. And today, Lord, as we listen to Dr. Joe Parita, may we learn new information from him that we can also share to our patients and be able to make them better and well in whatever problems they have in their musculoskeletal diseases. Thank you, O oh God, for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Dr. Joe, it's now your time. Okay. So please go ahead. Well Thank you so much, Jim, for that introduction. I, and I hold Jim and many of my friends in the Philippines in a very dear place in my heart. I mean, I'm going to admit it. Now, don't tell this to a lot of other people, but of all the countries I've visited, it's one of my favorites. Really a good time there and good people and people who want to learn. Okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is it's anti-aging, all right, but it also goes to stem cells. So stem cell aging pathways and basically how pathways in the body age. Now, here's a way I describe pathways to my patients. Think of the body with its organs and its cells as the computer hardware. The pathways are the computer software. Now, most of the time when you have a problem with your computer, it's not your hard drive, it's not your hardware, it's your software, you reboot it. And that's what we're basically trying to talk about today, how some of these pathways can affect your regenerative medicine procedures, your anti-aging, et cetera. And you notice a lot of these things go to one thing, mitochondria. So we're going to talk about a couple of these different things. So basically, we have the various aspects of aging and stem cell pathways, et cetera. And we call what we have the, the hallmarks of aging, basically the causes of the damage, genome instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, loss of proteosis. Then we have antagonistic hallmarks. And then we have integrative hallmarks. So basically, this is what I call upstream causes of aging. These are more downstream causes of aging over here. They result from these guys up here. So if you correct these problems here, these problems are going to go away. And again, Jim, I believe, is going to record this. I'm more than happy to share my slides. This is not, this is a learning session. This is for something that we can all learn by. And we all can teach each other. So, you know, I always have a, I always have a saying, though, the more you learn, the more you don't know and the more you have to learn then. So hopefully you'll have to learn a lot more tonight after this. So you see, again, some various hallmarks of aging. Uh, just another slide that kind of restates everything. And again, we see here what happens, DNA damage, uh, aging of the niche, systemic aging, um, enhancing mitochondrial function. If I had to say one thing is probably the most important, although they're important, I'd have to say mitochondria. We're learning more and more how mitochondria influences so many different things. Anyway, one of the things we kind of need to think about a little bit when we talk about aging and anti-aging and stem cells is the, the growth cycle, the cell cycle. You know, we have the G1, which is growth, and then we have the DNA replication, and then we have preparation for mitosis, and then we have the M phase. And a lot of these pathways interfere with these pathways and various different things. And you'll find a lot of medications a lot of chemotherapies will also 
uh, go ahead and interfere with the pathway to prevent, let's say, the growth of cancer cells and things like that. Now, the question becomes, why do antioxidants, hormones, and vitamins fail to reverse aging? You know, we can give these things, we can make people feel, feel better, but we're really not reversing aging because these are downstream effects that we're trying to treat. We need to go upstream because if we address problems upstream, the downstream problems hopefully are gonna go away. Now, the first thing we'll talk a little bit about is telomeres. Remember, telomeres are the ends of the DNA. Now, every time your cells reproduce, they lose a little snippet of DNA. And again, this is what the telomere looks like. Now, your, your cells are gonna be, the telomeres are gonna be better when I started the talk. And by the time I'm done with the talk, your telomeres are gonna be a little shorter because of the fact that they constantly lose some DNA. They constantly lose that little end, okay? Now, the thing that can put the telomere back on is something called telomerase, which is an enzyme that's found in certain cells and telomerase can, can make aging pretty much stop because it doesn't allow the telomeres to degradate. Now, the problem is most cells in the body do not produce telomerase. There are a couple of cells that produce this. For instance, cancer cells will produce telomerase. That's why they're immortal. Now, other cells that produce telomerase are basically our reproductive cells. That's why a man can be 80 years old and he can father a child and the child's DNA is not going to be, you know, 80 year old DNA. Now there may be some damage from him being 80 years on, on earth, but the, the DNA itself is still going to be pristine as far as length is concerned, because the telomerase preserved the telomeres of the reproductive cells. And again, we can see here, we, we know that the longer the telomere is, typically the more uh, efficient is the cell in doing its job. That's why, for instance, an embryonic stem cell in some respects would be a great cell to do regenerative medicine, but there's a lot of other baggage with it. But you can see here, look at the length, telomere length of a um, embryonic cell versus an adult cell. The longer that, that the telomere, the more efficient that cell is typically, okay? Now we can see a lot of things that can influence telomeres. And these are common sense things like glutathione, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin D, magnesium, calcium, et cetera. And you know, you look at a lot of these zinc, and you look at a lot of these supplements and you say, isn't that interesting? A lot of these are the same supplements. They're kind of saying, hey, these are good supplements to take to maybe help prevent COVID because it's probably making our telomeres and our whole immune system healthier and maybe preventing some of the, um, the uh, attrition of those telomeres. And again, this is just another slide that kind of explains the same thing I've been talking about. And again, this is a, some experimentation that's been done to try and see if we can uh, reverse some of the uh, telomere degradation. Now, I was just talking to a, a good Russian friend of mine. He's a doctor that uh, trained in Russia, but now he lives in the United States. And he said that the Israelis have come up with a protocol to increase telomere length by using, among other things, hyperbaric oxygen. So uh, more to come. I'll keep you posted on it. But here's an interesting thing. This is the unified theory of aging. This was um, on an article by um, a Dr. Deep Pinero and it concerned a good friend of mine uh, named is Bill Andrews. Now, Bill basically is looking for compounds that stimulate telomerase. Now, what we find here is when we get short telomeres, eventually what it does is it starts affecting the mitochondria. Like I said, mitochondria seem to be the culprit for a lot of things. Once the mitochondria start to fail, that's it. Then you're, you're pretty much done as far as the cell is concerned. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and this has some some bearing on the telomeres is something called a V-cell. I've talked to some of you guys in the past about it. It's a very small cell. It's called a very small embryonic-like stem cell, V-cell. And look at the size of it here compared, oops, compared to some of the other sizes uh, of cells. It's very small smell. But here's the interesting thing about this cell. It makes telomerase. So what does that tell and, and now, remember, these V-cells are found in each and every one of us. So what does that tell me? It tells me that, hey, I have a cell in my body that the DNA is pristine. And these cells can, these are pluripotent cells. The trick with these cells is to go and activate them. And this is how we usually typically do that. We have to put them at hypothermia at four degrees centigrade in hypoxia. And typically we leave them overnight because these cells are what we call quiescent. They're basically asleep, but they have to be prodded into becoming active. But once they're activated, unlike most stem cells that are given, let's say intravenously, they do not get trapped in the lungs. They'll go all nooks and crannies. They'll go through the blood-brain barrier. They can correct many different problems. 
Interestingly enough, they're found in non-centrifuge bone marrow malignants. Now we stimulate them by a variety of some supplements to stimulate the bone marrow to release a lot of these cells into the circulation. Then we'll draw about 210 cc's of blood and we'll end up with a product of about 60 cc's of these cells mixed with some plasma, PRP growth factors, et cetera. But here's one of the interesting things about these cells when they're given to a patient. What they seem to do is increase the telomere length of the cells of the immune system. What does that tell you? That if I'm giving these cells back to that patient, I'm gonna hopefully make his immune system grow younger in age. And if it grows younger, hopefully it's gonna become stronger. It's gonna let him fight autoimmune diseases. And we've had great results with these cells in autoimmune diseases. And so it's something to, to keep in mind. And it's interesting, before we started the conference, I was talking to Jim about these cells and how important they were. Now, another thing I wanna address I said that these cells were quiescent cells. Now there's another type of cell, and I'm sure a lot of you know about it already, it's called a senescent cell. Now a senescent cell is one that should have died, but did not die. It continues to hang on, so to speak, but the problem is it causes havoc in the body. What it'll do is it'll cause the secretion of various uh, inflammatory cytokines and things like that. Now, look at what causes these cells, that be genetic factors, telomere erosion, DNA damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, all the things we know that lead to aging. But these cells say, oh, I'm not gonna die, I'm gonna continue to live. And you can see what they do, cause chronic inflammation, and they cause stem cell exhaustion, they cause disruption of our proteins, and basically other nutrient uh, dysfunctions. So they can no longer replicate, but they basically are pro-inflammatory secretomes, and they do damage on many different levels. Now, um, uh, basically, you need some of these cells. They're very important. You don't want to eliminate them all because it does help with tumor suppression, wound healing, et cetera. But you want to take what they call synolytic agents or synotherapeutic agents, basically on an intermittent basis. Because if you do, you'll be able to get rid of a lot of these cells. Your results will be better. There's no question about it. One of the good synolytic agents is an over-the-counter um, supplement called Fistin. It's found in strawberries and things like that. And another one is Quercetin. And then there's some other ones out there. Now, here we can see here some more of the synolytic agents. Um, and these compounds basically have a positive effect on aging pathways. And some of the things that we know that, that work pretty well, metformin, rapamycin, and I'll get into these later in the lecture. Um, so very important things. Now, here's one that's interesting. This is what I've used in my office many times. This is from a number of university studies Basically, I had a patient today actually gave this information to the University of Texas, Wake Forest University, and Mayo Clinic. What they did is they combined quercetin orally with this medication called distinibid. Now, distinibid is a leukemia medicine that we're using off-label, and basically it has profound effects on getting rid of these senescent cells. Now, I can tell you, uh, you can buy this medicine, distinibid. In India, it's about $8 a pill. If you go in the United States, it's about $600 a pill. Oh. Lost my uh, program here, guys. Sorry. Let's see if we can get it back now. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? I apologize. Let me see if I can call it up again. You know, one of those technical little glitches. Okay, it looks like we're starting again. Okay, so let's kind of just move along here. All right, we're, we're almost there. Okay, getting close. Okay, so there we are. And again, here's some of the other things that cause senescence. The, the usual characters, the usual suspects, dyslipidemia, immune dysfunction, you know, basically diabetes where you have IGF-1, growth hormone deregulation, insulin resistant diabetes. Again, they can cause these cells and then these cells will cause more of the same problems, insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction, et cetera. So, it's kind of a uh, vicious cycle, so to speak. Now, another interesting thing and very important in anti-aging medicine and stem cell pathways is something called the P53 gene. Now, this is a gene that basically is called the tumor suppressor gene. Now, what this does is it will analyze a cell. Now, if the cell has minor damage, it'll go ahead and fix the cell and let it to continue uh, to divide. If the cell has quite a bit of damage, it's gonna basically try and halt the cell's division and basically try and um, eliminate the cell. So it's a very important thing. Now this 
This gene is very important in the processing of cancer. Uh, most of our cancers are because we have a mutation of the P53 gene. Now to give you an example of how important this gene is, an elephant, which is pretty much the largest mammal we know of in the world essentially, almost never gets a cancer because it has multiple copies of the P53 gene, unlike us where we have one. Um, but interestingly enough, again, you see some of the things that P53 is responsible for, DNA repair, angiosis, uh, angiogenesis, excuse me, autoregulation. Um, and again, some of the things that it can do. Now I have a lady that I work with, she's one of my gurus, so to speak, and she's making some patches for me that have the P53 protein on it. And we just put this patch on the patient, there's penetrating molecules, they will go down into the patient and we use a patch maybe every six weeks, every three months, something like that, depending on what we're trying to do. So something we were very high on and we've used it in the past, we're gonna use it again. Now, let's move on to another pathway, the sirtuin pathway, the sirtuin genes. One of the most important pathways, if, if I have to say one important pathway, I'll say it, I hate to do that because they're all important, but this is maybe one of the most important ones because you can see what does it affect? The mitochondria, these three, there's seven different pathways of the sirtuins and the nucleus, okay? But really these are the guys right here and the cert ones. Um, now, we know what, what's some of the reasons that these pathways are important. Well, the one thing we know that scientifically will slow down aging is basically starvation and calorie restriction. And what does it do? It stimulates a sirtuin family, okay? And you can see here some of the various jobs that the seven different their sirtuins do. And again, this is something you can look at at your leisure. We don't have to belabor it. Again, the sirtuin gene has profound effects on many different pathways. It can affect a lot of the other pathways. Um, we think that this may be a gene that we're going to look into more for COVID treatments because we think that this can have a profound effect on the COVID and really stimulating immunity, et cetera. And you can see here, and we're going to start right off the bat, NAD, NADH. NAD is one of the most important things for anti-aging and basically maybe one of the most important things for success in your stem cell procedures. And we're going to get to that very shortly. But we see all the things that any, excuse me, that the sirtuins touch, especially the sirtuin one gene, all these different things here, think about it, oxidative stress, protection from chronic inflammation, uh, increases hormonal efficiency. Remember what I was telling you about? Upstream corrections. This is an upstream correction. You stimulate this, you turn those genes back on, you're gonna start getting upstream corrections because you can see decrease, increased insulin sensitivity, epigenetic silencing, uh, decreased lipid accumulations, cell resistance to O2 deficiency, all good things. So very important thing to, to realize. Again, we can see how it has effects on various aspects in the body. Okay, now, the most important thing for the sirtuins probably, in our case at least, is what we call NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. That is probably the most important supplement you could give your patient, because what does it do? Well, NAD is responsible for the production of ATP. As we know, ATP is the cell's energy currency. Without ATP, the cells can't survive. Now, the problem is as we age, the amount of NAD in our body starts going down. The body has no choice but to shunt the NAD to the cells. Now, when I say NAD, it's really NAD plus, but it has to shunt them to the cells. So what happens is we'll start kind of cutting corners in other places. For instance, we'll cut corners on certain enzymes that repair DNA damage. That's why this damage starts accumulating. That's why cancers start coming, et cetera. So that's why you can see how important these genes are. So we can see here, again, the sirtuins are very important and um, they do many different things. So NAD is an essential substrate for the production of the sirtuins and it drives these enzymes and look what else it does, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which stimulates your bone marrow to produce more stem cells, NF kappa beta, which is basically the thermostat of inflammation, the FOXO genes, we'll get into some of these in a little while. Um, so, you know, a lot of different things here that you can look at. So basically the sirtuins really have an effect on a lot of other pathways. So it's like the main operating system of the body, so to speak. So we can see here again, NAD, 
and what are some of the things, exercise, calorie restriction, fasting. We know that those are very good things to stimulate the production of NAD and to stimulate these, these sirtuins. And you can see here what happens. And again, I keep stressing NAD, NAD, NAD. And you can give NAD. Now we use NAD intravenously in our office. We also use it orally. If you don't have access to the intravenous form, then you can try the oral form. We have it available. Uh, we can see if we can maybe ship it to you guys if need be, but hopefully you can get a source of it there in the Philippines to, uh, to use. But here's the problem you have with NAD. Every 20 years of life, the NAD levels drop by 50%. And that's a significant drop there. Now, how can we boost NAD? Again, healthy and healthy and a fasting diet. And one of the best diets, believe it or not, to stimulate NAD is a keto diet. Okay, exercise, NAD precursors like the NAD ribose and things like that. And then consuming uh, other types of things or inhibiting them. So here's the three outcomes of NAD levels. If your level is low, you're going to have disease. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Your mitochondria are not going to function properly. You're going to be in dire straits. You're going to die if the levels are very low. And you have longevity if you have your basically a, a decent amount of NAD. Now, the other thing you have to worry about is the ratio of NAD to NADH. You know, NADH is basically a, a marker of aging, okay? Now, if you have NAD and, and you have too much NADH, then again, you're, you're in trouble also. So it's not just the amount of NAD, it's also the amount of, of NADH too. Now, there's a lot of different pathways. You have what they call the press handler. This is really a lot of biochemistry. A lot of, you know, some of it is esoteric. I just kind of put the slides in there so you can look at them. But that's how NAD is made uh, from dietary nicotinamide acid. You know, niacin is sort of a form of NAD. Um, and you can see there's various pathways here. Uh, but we like to, you know, give them uh, nicotinamide ribose or nicotinamide monoribose and intravenous NAD. And that works very well. You can also do this uh, nasally. We're gonna have some patches soon that'll have something called an NAD kinase, which will increase the amount of NAD going to the cell. But here's the problem that we run into with the NAD. Again, remember I said the cells have to have it. If they don't have ATP, the cell dies. But these are certain enzymes Okay, this is an enzyme that repairs DNA damage, P-A-R-A. CD38 enzymes, basically immune system. And NQ01, basically, this balances the NAD, NADH ratio. This is called the longevity gene, okay? And you can stimulate that by certain supplements and by giving the patient NAD+. Now, again, this is the P-A-R-P. This is basically repairing DNA. And remember now, if you don't have enough NAD, you, this gene is not going to be working. It's going to be shut off and DNA damage is going to accumulate. And instead of getting a healthy cell, you're going to have a damaged cell. So DNA damage, and ma but it's a massive consumer. So that's why you have to give your patient this NAD. Um, and that's why you, when you're doing your stem cell repairs, it's not a bad idea. I'm starting to put all my patients on at least oral NAD when I'm doing the stem cells after I do it. Okay. CD38, um, basically, uh, it can destroy the NAD before it even enters the cell. It's a huge consumer of NAD. Uh, so again, we have to take that into mind. And then again, we have the NAD, NADH ratio. The number's not important, but it should be around 700 to one. And that's what's the importance of that, okay? And again, these are slides that you'll look at at your leisure and see all the little, you know, sub captions there and you read about it. So again, 700 to one. One NQ01 pathway, NADH is considered a marker of aging, and NQ1 uh, can be stimulated by something called Padiarco. This is a, um, a supplement that comes from a tree in Brazil, and it's a very potent stimulator of this pathway. Um, another uh, potent stimulator is intravenous ozone and things like that. And again, we see the NADP, NADH. Remember, it's this, this electron that's really, when all said and done, it's a matter of transferring electrons from one thing to another. Remember the uh, electron pathway and things like that, the Krebs cycle. That's all really what, what this is dealing with, you know, how you can transfer and make ATP. And again, like I say, there's something called the nicotinamide ribose kinase. That'll increase the amount of NAD going into the cell. And again, look at this at your leisure. And this is a patch that we're going to start using of the kinase, okay? Now, ultimately, 
we have increased NAD will increase the mitochondria in health and in number. The more mitochondria, the healthier your cell. You know, your stem cells, when you use them, they undergo tremendous stress. The last thing you want to do is have them, you know, deficient in energy. So anything you can do to give them more energy, to give them a little better chance of survival for a few days, they're not going to last long anyway, but that would help. So NAD is very important because it helps the mitochondria better. Now, um, we can basically help fight cellular stress. You know, you put cells into a joint, into the spine, a disc or something like that, very hostile conditions, uh, but this will increase the stem cell survival. Now, interestingly enough, we think that this is very important in neurologic conditions because what we're now learning is that mitochondria act as central regulators of the neural stem cell fate and cognitive function. You know, mitochondria are not just guys that produce, you know, organelles that produce ATP. They have a lot of other functions. They may be maybe the most important organelle in the whole cell. Um, and this was very important in uh, this study. They found that mitochondria were basically a key regulator of neural stem cell fate. And they basically, they had more mitochondria. They allowed the stem cells to start renewing and differentiating. So we think that this is one of the reasons why NAD may be helpful in some neurologic conditions. High doses, though, maybe, maybe 500 or 1,000 milligrams, you know, on a number of consecutive days. That seems to have some help with Parkinson's and things like that. So it's important that you go there. Now, another thing we have to realize, again, NAD, energy, et cetera, all interrelated. Stem cells basically don't really require much energy, you know, when they're just kind of being themselves requires very little energy. They're basically going on glycolysis. But once stem cells basically start to differentiate, all of a sudden they are becoming hogs of energy. They need a lot more ATP, so they have to switch over from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. Basically, they need to produce ATP by the use of NAD and things like that. So basically that's where, again, it's important because NAD will help the cells differentiate. So we can see here, primary goal or primary means of energy is glycolysis for a stem cell when it differentiates oxidative phosphorylation. So what else affects the sirtuins? Calorie restriction, keto low carb diet, high intensity interval training, and extreme cold or extreme heat, such as a sauna or going out in the snow and things like that. Not too much of that in the Philippines, obviously. Uh, the other thing that the extreme cold and heat do is they also will help in the production of heat shock proteins, which allow the protein to fold properly into the cell. So another anti-aging uh, type compound. Now ozone basically injected into a joint will increase the NAD available and has a direct effect on the sirtuin gene. So another important aspect of ozone. But now we have to realize it's not all good with NAD because remember now we talked about a senescent cell. Now realize NAD and senescent cells are on a collision course. These are senescent cells. Remember now, these are the cells that should have died but did not die. You give them NAD, they're gonna flourish and, and prosper. So if you're giving NAD, you have to make sure that you basically will give uh, some uh, synolytic agents, some synotherapeutics to get rid of some of those senescent cells. Otherwise you're actually doing the patient maybe more harm than good. So it's a very important aspect of treatment when you're using NAD to also give synolytic agents at the same time. Now, again, calorie restriction, very important in anti-aging. You can see here, it affects the insulin IGF-1 pathway, uh, DNA methylation, all sorts of different pathways can be affected by just a simple thing as calorie restriction. Um, and again, uh, we, it affects multiple different pathways. These are all different pathways, and we're going to talk about these pathways shortly. Now, the keto food pyramid. Uh, very important for you to see what you eliminate, bread, pasta, sugars, corns, beans, rice, etc. But that is a very interesting diet because it can really help produce um, a lot of benefits on the aging pathways. Uh, it, it's really not that controversial anymore. We really think the keto diet may be something good. Now, also, we talk about the free radicals. Again, that's all related to a lot of these things, DNA damage. We're trying to fix it and things like that. And that comes from various forms of inflammation, diet, et cetera. Okay, now the NRF2 pathway, another very important pathway. Not as esoteric as you may think. 
consider this pathway as a thermostat of anti-inflammation. This pathway will dramatically reduce inflammation in the body. How do we basically uh, stimulate it? Well, some stress will stimulate it. Calorie restriction again, there you go. But look what it leads to, longevity, stress defense, and improved metabolism, okay? So here's a normal cell. Here's a cell damaged by free radicals. Let's go back there for a minute. And then a cell with oxidative stress. So NRF2 is gonna hopefully get this guy to go back over here. Um, now it's a modulator of antioxidant response in our body and it rapidly targets oxidative stressors. So basically we have to keep that in mind. I think I have one or two more slides that really show this a lot better. It's the master regulator of antioxidant response, but let me see if I have a picture. Ah, good. So here we are here. Now the um, NRF2 uh, gene basically protein hangs out in the cytoplasm, okay? But once there's a stress, it goes from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it's actually what we call a transcription factor. What it's going to do is it's gonna go into that nucleus and turn on certain genes and it's gonna tell the genes, hey, I want you to make antioxidant. So these are called the R genes, the antioxidant response elements. They will go ahead and produce a number of very potent antioxidants in the body to dramatically reduce the stress in the body. Um, now here we see this picture here. So basically NRF2 is kind of held as a prisoner in the cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm by this thing called KEP1. But when there's a certain stimulation, stress or something, the NRF2 breaks free, it goes into the nucleus, and again, it produces those, it transcribes the certain genes and it's producing an antioxidant response. This is probably the most important pathway in the body to reduce inflammation. Probably very important when you have someone who's sick with COVID. Stimulate this pathway, you're gonna get them out of the woods. Don't stimulate this pathway and you have NRF2, uh, excuse me, uh, NF kappa beta, you're gonna have a patient in cytokine storm. Okay, again, we basically have it here. We're in the cells and we go into the nucleus. Now we go to the opposite, NF kappa beta, okay? It's a transcription factor, all right, but what it does is it goes ahead and basically causes inflammation. Now, sometimes you need inflammation. Sometimes, you know, you have a bacterial infection, you have a viral infection, you wanna get rid of it. You wanna go ahead and get that inflammation to get rid of it. But when this thing gets out of hand, you then have a cytokine storm. Remember, cytokine storm is basically three major things. You're getting interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor. They're being turned on and they're stimulating the immune system to produce more uh, of these uh, bad cytokines, and that's where you get your storm. But you can see what NR, uh, NRF, NF kappa beta does. It can do many different things here. Now, it basically is the most important factor of inflammation in the body. So if you can kind of quell this inflammation, so this is the opposite of NRF2, and basically production of TNF, uh, IL-1 and IL-6. Um, now this again, lives in the cytoplasm, but if it gets that single, it goes in and it's another transcription factor, but it tells the other set of genes, hey, go ahead and make these um, bad anti-inflammatories, which in some cases is not bad because it's trying to deal with an infection. The problem we're seeing with NF kappa beta is, unfortunately, this is a pathway that gets turned on to the on position as we age. So it becomes more and more active as we age. So a lot of this research now is looking for ways to basically turn this back off. And we know that NF kappa beta uh, can be turned off by stimulation of the NRF2. It sounds like we're kind of, you know, giving all kinds of different things. And these names will, will not mean much to you now, but if you look at this a couple of times, it'll all start to sink in and make sense to you. And what are some of the things that we can do to kind of quell this down? Well, curcumin, we know that that's a good supplement to use. And EGCG, basically green tea extract, works very well. Now, another pathway is something called the mTOR pathway. And this is basically for longevity and performance. Now, mTOR basically, um, deals with a lot of different things. It's nutrient sensing among other things. Uh, and there's some inhibitors. And one of the inhibitors is something called rapamycin. Rapamycin is an interesting compound. This was found in the um, 
soil of Easter Island. And basically uh, what they found with this thing is it would work wonderfully for helping in organ rejection. It would make the organs not be rejected. So it can have a profound effect on the body, but um, it can, you know, it can have some side effects also though. So basically mTOR means a million target of rapamycin. Uh, so that's what they call by mTOR. And basically this rapamycin arrested fungal activity in the soil. But now we see how, remember I talked to you in the beginning about the, the growth cycle and the cell cycle. Now this affects the G1 phase and it also affects T lymphocytes and it can act as an immunosuppressant. So um, if you can kind of, you gotta be a little careful with this because it is an immunosuppressant, but there's some, what we call rapamycin analogs and they may be helpful to us too. Uh, again, some of the processes it cell, it, it does stimulates protein synthesis, autophagy. Autophagy means basically the cells kind of consuming parts of dead cells and kind of recirculating them again. Um, so basically it helps with metabolic sensing. So it's a very important uh, uh, pathway to, to master. And we're learning more and more about this. Okay, and you can see how, what this does is uh, the inhibitors suppress nutrient availability. You know, if you have too many nutrients available, Cells don't really do that well with it. Yeah, they may like to grow. Cancer loves it, but cells themselves don't do as well with it. So if you can kind of get some of the nutrients down uh, and you kind of, you know, decrease the amount of nutrients, you're going to have basically a healthier cell. That's why starvation, again, it kind of kind of comes with starvation more or less. And again, uh, inhibition may disrupt cancer cell growth by various ways because it's kind of, you know, suppressing the amount of nutrients available to the cancer cell. Uh, and there's two portions, there's the mTOR1 and mTOR2, again, kind of really a little esoteric, not anything to be that worried about. But here's some of the things that can stimulate this pathway. Apinogen, that's found in apples, I believe, curcumin, uh, green tea extract, fistin, quercetin, isoflavonoids, arbor lipoic acid, and certain forms of vitamin E. I believe it's the vitamin E3, uh, tacoferro. And again, some more things about what mTOR does, uh, glycolysis, RNA translation, messenger RNA. Uh, so it does a lot of important things. And again, it gets involved with NAD also. AMPK is another pathway. Basically, this is a very important pathway for mitochondrial biogenesis. And it's also a master switch to basically regulate the uptake of glucose, burning of fat, and formation of new mitochondria. So you bet you this is an important pathway when you're basically affecting glucose uptake, burning fats, and basically forming new mitochondria, it's an important thing. Now, burning fats, what does that remind you of? A keto diet. Okay, so you can see here how keto diet can stimulate this pathway also. And we can see here when you have a deficit, it leads to diabetes, hypertension, certain cancers, fatty liver, polycystic ovary, uh, cardiovascular diseases, dyslipidemia, et cetera. And some of the things that can lead to it in activity, genetics, so go ahead and exercise, by the way, and overnutrition. And again, just some things where we see what uh, this uh, pathway can lead to and activation and aging, okay? And look at the various things that it can affect, protein synthesis, glycogen synthesis, cholesterol, mitochondria fusion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, very important, okay? So basically the important thing here is AMPK and mitochondrial production. What it does is it triggers the disruption of basically um, defective mitochondria and it places it kind of recirculates their parts and makes new mitochondria from them. So this is an important aspect. Again, of all the things, mitochondria are probably the most important organelles in the cell by far. I think more, almost more important than, than the nucleus. I mean, it's hard to say that because the nucleus has the DNA, but very, very important, okay? Now, um, Again, they also, it also comes along with the ATP, ADP, again, the Krebs cycle, a very important activation of the Krebs cycle here. Okay, now what can increase uh, AMPK? Well, the keto diet, calorie restriction, high intensity interval exercise. You see the same kind of things make this pathway, the same as other pathways important. Now, terstilbin, okay, some of you may know that, some of you may not. That's basically the more active form of resveratrol, okay? Barberine is another important thing. Barberine has a very similar effect to metformin. 
Okay, now metformin is a very good AMPK stimulator. Actually, in the United States, they're doing a study now of metformin to see for anti-aging. You know, metformin is a typical diabetes medicine, but there's a lot of people that use metformin for anti-aging and anti-cancer. Remember, metformin diminishes the amount of glucose available. Cancers love glucose, so that's why the importance is there. And the deadly effects of a deficit, you can see all sorts of bad, bad things start happening when we have not enough uh, AMPK uh, stimulation. Now, autophagy, I've talked about that. A lot of these pathways basically deal with autophagy. And you can see here, damaged protein in mitochondria, it recycles it and it makes uh, free amino acids and then it repair and reconstruct new cells. So basically the cell, the body likes to recirculate a lot of its parts. These cells don't just die and poof, go away. You know, they take out, okay, let me take out these uh, nucleic acids, let me take out these uh, parts of the mitochondria, et cetera, and it recycles them. So it makes it a lot easier. Uh, so it's a recycling program, very important in anti-aging, okay? High fat, low carb, keto, keto diet again. So there's a lot of science for the keto diet. I mean, it really does make a lot of sense, quite honestly. And you can see here the various pathways that this deals with. Again, the usual guys here, NAD, sirtuins, autophagy, uh, all kind of interrelated with each other. Now, supplements that increase autophagy, omega-3 fish oils, vitamin D, um, all sorts of things. Coconut oil, very good source of, uh, of uh, increasing the uh, autophagy. Now, another pathway is called the FOXO pathways. And by the way, all these pathways, I have, you know, little blogs about them on my website, uh, stcell.com. And I write all my own blogs. So you guys can go ahead and find them and read them and download them and do whatever you wish because they are important thing. Now, FOXO is also important in osteoarthritis uh, because there's certain FOXO genes that can really affect articular cartilage. But you can see here again, what does FOXO uh, deal with? Well, apoptosis, cell cycle arrest. Again, we have that autophagy, food intake, gluconeogenesis, stem cell maintenance, stress resistance, really important for a lot of different things here. Uh, so basically it's called the FOXO family, of the forkhead transcription factors. Many of these pathways are actually transcription factors when all said and done, it gets into that DNA and tells certain cells to turn on and do what they need to do. Um, and again, it, it goes with insulin regulators. So again, nutrient sensing is very important in these things. And we see some of the things here that we can do. Mitochondria, again, permeability, uh, cell cycle arrest, neoplastic control, a lot of different things there. And basically how they're involved in anti-aging. Let's go back a little bit there. Uh, you can see that they affect the mitochondria, make the mitochondria healthier. So again, typical things, and it's a continuing theme throughout things. Uh, but we can see here it promotes uh, mitophagy, basically new mitochondria. Now IGF-1 is the one pathway that's very controversial. Is it good, bad, or indifferent, okay? You can find literature that says this is a great pathway, but it's a double-edged sword because it can increase your bones. No other sons of butts about it, cognition, heart health, muscle, exercise support, metabolism, but on the same token, it can increase cancer. And believe it or not, it may actually increase aging because you know one of the things that IGF-1 does, it encourages cell division. Cell division encourages basically the, um, the telomeres to degradate, et cetera. So we don't have a clear cut answer for this. And you know, the best bit of advice is you should take some IGF-1, but don't overdo it. So you can see here, cellular repair, renovation, muscle bone tissue growth, and it can make a lot of different things. You know, a lot of people can do very well with this, okay? Um, but you can also get cellular burnout and premature aging. So um, we, can, we can tell you that if you can block this pathway somewhat, it actually leads to longevity in animals. So if basically you decrease the activity of IGF-1, they seem to live longer, people and animals. So again, it's a very controversial thing and there's no clear cut answers because again, you can have this uh, uh, cell growth and survival and it'll make that cancer cell do better. So the only conclusion we make uh, is basically avoid too much or too little. I mean, I take a little bit of velvet deer antler. I'm gonna take it for a month or so, then I'll go off for a couple of months and I'll take it again and, and go from there. Velvet deer antler basically has the IGF-1 in it. 
Another pathway, we're getting near the end, guys, is the um, ATM pathway. It helps with genetic uh, instability, I should say. And basically, it helps to preserve the DNA double strands. Um, it leads to cell cycle arrest sometimes, DNA repair or apoptosis. Now, parabiosis, young blood into old blood. So basically what they would do is kind of connect the circulation to these two um, rats here. One would be old, one would be new. And so the, um, in aging, we had decreased neurogenesis, impaired synastic plasticity, but basically you had regeneration. You had neurogenesis increased, unknown effect on uh, synaptic plasticity, unknown effect on cognition. But in general, some of the studies said, hey, this is really good. It seems to you know, give the young blood to the old person, they seem to do better. And we weren't sure exactly what it was. A lot of research said it was growth differentiating factor 11. Uh, and it's a member of the TGF beta superfamily and oxytocin. So we said, wow, that's a good thing. We should start taking young blood from everybody. And there were a number of companies in the United States that were doing this until they were shut down by the FDA because we're not sure if this is really the case. These are some of the questions. Is it a single factor? Is it multiple factors? How are they regulated? Uh, and as a matter of fact, some of the studies have shown what we thought was this growth factor 11. Um, one study in 2015 found that basically it inhibits rather than promotes muscle regeneration. So the bottom line is we're not sure. If I had to guess, I'm gonna guess that this is probably of some validity to it, that young blood can help rejuvenate an older person. And with that, I'm done. And I'm more than happy to take any questions you guys have. Thank you, Dr. Joe, for that uh, very uh, nice uh, lecture on anti-aging. Now, I have a question. How often do you do the NAD uh, diffusion, per, uh, perfusion? Okay, I take NAD every day, about 450 milligrams a day orally. The IV. Once in a while, IV. I will do intravenous. If you do an IV, how, how, how do you do it? Every, every month? Well, okay, we can do an IV. You can do it every month, you never can get too much NAD. Okay, now, um, if you have the option of getting it in your country, uh, intravenous uh, NAD, one trick I'm gonna give you is you have to give the patient TMG, trimethylglycine, which is a methyl donor, ahead of time because it'll make them tolerate the NAD a lot easier. Otherwise, you have to do an NAD drip fairly slowly because the patient starts getting chest tightness, headache, et cetera, you give them this TMG and it pretty much goes away. So, you know, I have, if I have a patient who really has some autoimmune issues, I'll give them NAD, maybe 500 milligrams, you know, maybe like three different sessions over a, a one or two week period. And then, we, and then we put them on the oral and see how they do. Of nice. all the supplements, probably the most important one. If you go away with one thing in this uh, lecture tonight, it's the importance of NAD. I see. Yeah, we have, we have an AD here, so. We're, we're just trying to know if, uh, uh, because some people are doing it. Immunity, there's, there's nothing it won't do. It's, it's a wonder drug. A lot of the work was done by Dr. Sinclair at Harvard. Uh, he runs the anti-aging division at Harvard and Mass General. I see. Okay, uh, Jeremy, why don't you ask your question? Jeremy, hello, Jeremy. Hello. I won't bite you, I promise you. Hi, hi, good, good morning. Can you hear How me? You? Hello? Yes, I can hear you fine. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pirita, for that uh, wonderful lecture. It's my pleasure. I, yeah, I've also been reading up on NAD and NMN supplements uh, recently. Is there any role for uh, just regular NMN supplements it's, since it's already a precursor to NAD? No, that, that's what I take. I mean, you're not able to take NAD+. plus. Orally. Yes. I mean, it, it doesn't happen. You have to take the precursors and hope that it gets converted in your body and ends up in the cell. Not, not the best of ways to do it, but that's what I'm doing. I mean, most of the time. So it's very important, I think, to do because some NAD is better than none. Yes, yes. Is there anything in particular that I should look for in an NMN supplement before uh, purchasing it? All right. I can tell you the one I take myself. It's from a company called Thorn Research in the United States. Uh, Okay. I and also what you that. want to do is you want to get an NAD compound, preferably that will have some synolytic agents in it also. 
So you always want to look for an NAD that maybe has some quercetin in it or something like that, because you don't want to make those synolytic cells healthier. Uh, also, it's not, maybe not a bad idea if you have an NAD that has either terstobin or maybe some resveratrol in it. That can sometimes help stimulate the sirtuin a little better. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doc. My pleasure. Yeah, any, any, any more question? Uh, another thing, uh, Dr. Joe, is uh, we see the benefit of uh, calorie restriction. So when you say calorie restriction, is it like fasting? You know, calorie restriction, whatever you want to make it, it's fasting. I mean, a lot of people say, okay, you should maybe not eat anything for 12 hours. I remember I was with, uh, I was lecturing once. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dr. Oz. Does that make any sense to you? Maybe yeah, not. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned He's a famous too. doctor here in the United States. Well, his partner was lecturing and he runs a very famous program. It's called an executive health program at the Cleveland Clinic. And he yeah. said, if anybody joins my program, they have to at least one day a month go on 500 calories. He said, preferably two days a month at least. So very important, because you see how many different pathways it stimulates the calorie restriction. Yeah, and uh, okay, very nice. So a any more question? Any more question from the- You can floor? always email me. I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to answer your emails. Yeah, this Hello, is- uh, um, Dr. Perita. Oh, yes. I, yes. Uh, I was just wondering as to how long does a patient need to be under calorie restriction or on keto diet to achieve uh, the desired effects of that? Aside from having a very low calorie count that you have said, do you, ha do you have an idea? Well, I, no, one know, no one knows. I mean, I think also you have to realize it's probably something that is dependent on the patient themselves. So, I mean, you know, the thing is you follow a common sense keto diet. I mean, look, you cheat here and there. I mean, I'll have some pizza you know, and stuff like that. But, you know, I try to really cut down on my sweets. I, I use stevia. I don't use any sugar, things like that. Um, and I think it's kind of a good program to follow most of the time. I mean, you cheat once in a while. You have some good foods, but you try and follow that diet because it does stimulate those pathways. And it's one of the easier and cheaper ways to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Joe, for uh, again hey guys. giving us Have a good morning wonderful and wonderful enjoy wonderful. the rest of your day. It's been my pleasure and an honor to talk to you all. Yeah. Good night. And you, you take good care, morning. Dr. Joe. And see all right, you. Take care, guys. I'll see you after this lecture. Yeah. All right. Please do. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Take care. Take care. God bless. Bye.